Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Either you guys really don't care about football or you really love Jesus. And I'm going to and I'm going to guess it's it's the latter. Packers are up 3 to 0 last time I checked though, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, so when I was 21 years old, uh, I was invited along with a group of friends to go to a church about an hour away from the church where I was attending at the time to help lead worship for the morning. It was a small church in Newport, New Hampshire, and the entire church building probably could fit in our sanctuary. This is a picture of it. Super tiny rural church in New Hampshire. It was a part of the denomination that our church was in, and it was an established church that was going through a season of revitalization, and their worship team needed a week off, so they called our church, another church in the denomination, saying, hey, could you send a group of people to lead worship for us. So I grew up playing instruments and playing drums. So myself and a group of people went up and led worship that morning. And um, it was so fascinating to be there. While it was a small church, it was alive with energy and momentum. And the pastor who was there was just leading incredibly well. You could feel the energy in the place. The, The sanctuary probably sat no more than 100 people, but it was packed to the brim. And so we led worship, we participated in their service, and at the end of the service, I got to chat with the pastor a little bit, and he was talking about story after story after story of things that God was doing in people's lives, stories of transformation, the way that God was at work, not only in their church, but in the community. And I left that morning just with great encouragement, like, man, God is at work in our community. God is doing great things. He's at work all across the state, which in New England is huge because they're known as the frozen chosen in New England, right? They're like small all and mighty, they say, like the church culture in New England just isn't, hasn't been thriving for the longest time. So a couple months go by, and I get uh, another phone call from this church saying, hey, would you mind coming back um, and preaching a sermon? I was still discerning a call to ministry about ready to go to seminary, and they thought, hey, let's get this young guy and give him an opportunity to preach. And I was like, oh, that'd be great. I'd love to go back. And they said, oh, and just so you know, there's a transition happening there. The pastor has left, and they're kind of in a season of transition. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that's unfortunate, and that's too bad. But that, those things happen, right? Pastors do come, they do go, they move on. And so I prepared my sermon. I made the 45-minute drive. And when I got to the church that weekend, I walked in, and it was empty, Now, it was about 30 minutes till the service, so like, you know, like, okay, people will start showing up, but it felt like there was just a different energy, and you're like, something has happened here. It almost felt lifeless, and one of the lay leaders came up to me, and I greeted him, and he just looked sad, and I said to him, you know, transitions can be rough, huh? He's like, yeah, if you want to call it that. And then he began to tell me the story of a disagreement that happened between the pastor and the board of that church. And it was a pretty like big disagreement. And that next Sunday, he preached his last sermon, but didn't tell anybody that it was his last sermon. And then the next Monday, wrote a letter to the congregation saying he was leaving and ended up taking a group of people from that church to start another church down the road. And I was like, oh, what a punch in the gut. And so that morning, um, I preached at that church, and it was probably 15 people in the room, as compared to 100 who had been there a few months prior. And I found myself just really sad, leaving that time, thinking, what was the disagreement? Like, what was the thing that caused this church that was on the verge of being revitalized to crumble and fall apart? And it raises the question for us, Like, is it ever okay to leave a church? Is it ever okay to leave a church? I'm going to guess you'll be quick to say yes, because many people here have probably left churches before. I've left a church before. I left another church in Atlanta to come to this church, right? We, We all go through seasons of life where things change for us. Right? We start attending a church, and we're a single individual. We get married, we have kids, and we just realize, oh, this church doesn't necessarily 
have the things that our family needs to thrive in our faith, and so we go to a different church. Or, or maybe you move, right? You are somewhere downtown, and you move out to Lake Country, and you're like, I want to be in a church in my community. I don't want to make the 35-minute drive every week. I really want to be involved. And so you think about going to a different church. I've only met one person in my entire life who has never left a church. It was a woman at our former church. She started going to this church in her early 20s when she came to faith and had been there 40 years. Only person I've, I've known who's stuck it out at one church her entire faith journey. And so it's not so much whether or not it's bad or inappropriate to leave a church, but the question is, what is the cause? What is the desire? What is the reason? And specifically, how do you work through that? Is it okay to leave a church when it comes to disagreement? And that's what Paul's concern is when he writes the book of Romans. Some people might think it's his theological tome. He's really trying to set out his theology, and that's his main priority as he writes the book of Romans. But it's actually a letter to a church that's going through disagreement. And Paul is concerned that it's going to cause this church to split. And as you step into chapter 14, that disagreement starts to come front and center. As you cross into 14, it's like this is the real reason why Paul is writing this letter in the first place. And this is how chapter 14 begins. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Now, Paul here starts chapter 14 making a distinction between two groups of people in the church in Rome. And he calls these two, peop these two groups of people the weak, and then later he will call them the strong. You see the reference here in verse 1 of chapter 14. When you get to chapter 15, verse 1, that's where you'll see Paul reference those who are strong in the faith. And understanding what Paul means by weak and strong is crucial to this section, and it really is a distinction he's making about the faith of these two groups of people. Now, when we hear the word weak in their faith, that might cause us to think that he's talking about a group of people who are unsure about what they believe. Like, they're unsure, they have big questions, they have major doubts, they don't know, did the resurrection really happen? Did Jesus really come back from the dead? They're unsure about the reliability of the scriptures, and they just have big questions, and their faith is weak, and it could implode at any moment, and they could walk away from the faith. And, and then we hear the term, those who are strong in their faith, and you think, oh, they have tons of Bible knowledge, they have been walking with the Lord forever, they could out-argue anybody in a debate about their faith, they're the ones who do really bold and courageous things, like they sell all their possessions, and they go live with the poor, and they go to other parts of the world. But in reality, that's not what Paul is talking about when he uses the term weak and strong. He, he's not talking about those who have a really strong faith and do bold and courageous things, and those who have a weak faith that's barely hanging on. Rather, he's using these terms, weak and strong, to talk about someone's understanding of the freedom that they have in their faith. Right? We say that Jesus sets us free. Like, he sets us free from the law of sin and death, but he also really just sets us free. We are free people. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean freedom in our faith is defined by you can go do whatever you want and live however you want. Rather, freedom in our faith is about being conformed to the design that God set out for you. It's about becoming the person that God intended you to be. So freedom actually does come with some restrictions. You think of a fish, right? A fish has a natural boundary in its life. A fish, is, a fish is free when it's doing the thing it was created to do, which is swim in water. When a fish gets outside of the water, it is not free, it dies. So what does it mean for us to be free in our faith? And Paul specifically here is talking about freedom in our faith along the lines of what he calls 
disputable matters. There are matters in our faith that are disputable, that that we can disagree on. And he's saying, and he's defining those who are weak in their faith are those who believe that they should be restricted on disputable matters. That restriction on these disputable matters is right. And those who are strong in their faith have really embraced the idea that Jesus has set me free. So therefore, I am able to engage in these disputable matters. And then from there, Paul gives an example. He gives an example of one of these disputable matters that is finding its way into the church in Rome. This is what he says in verse 2. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now, you read that verse, and it might raise the question, is Paul saying that in order to be a Christian, you have to be a vegetarian? I mean, because this last week, I went to Culver's, and I had a double bacon butter burger, and it was delicious, right? (laughs) Or you might be thinking, are there those in the church in Rome who are thinking that in order to be a true follower of Jesus, you have to be a vegetarian? Like, is that what Paul is saying, where he's saying some people only eat vegetables? And this is where context is wildly important. Because if you remember, the church in Rome, while Paul is using the distinction between weak and strong to describe two groups of people, there's another way you could describe the church along the lines of two groups of people, those who are Jewish Christians and those who are Gentile Christians. Those who are Jewish in their upbringing and came to see that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And those individuals would have been raised in Jewish culture with the Old Testament, all of the rhythms, laws, rituals, traditions, festivals, celebrations, all of those things. They would have been ethnically Jewish. And they would have seen, oh, Jesus is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. He's the one who we are called to follow. He is the true Savior of the world. So you have Jewish Christians who were raised with a Jewish mindset under Jewish custom. But then you have Gentile Christians, those who are from a pagan background, who don't have, know anything of the law, anything of the Old Testament, anything of the story of Moses or the prophets, and they are living with a very different worldview. So the issue here is how do you take these two groups of people who have different perspectives on the world and faith and bring them together? And one of the things that was true of Jewish Christians was that they had pretty significant dietary restrictions. If you go to Leviticus 11, a whole rousing chapter of things that they could and couldn't eat. Pork was one of those things. Like, they just were not allowed to eat pork. There were no ribs made in a Jewish household, no brats, no pancakes with bacon on the side, no pork at all. So imagine being told your entire life, that you cannot eat this one meat, and the reason is associated with your faith, your understanding of how the world works, and you've lived your entire life that way, and then somebody comes along and says, hey, guess what? You can eat that now. You would probably live in this place of like, really? Like, because you have been conditioned to believe that this is not permissible. God does not allow this. This is not okay. And so basically, the church here is wrestling with the freedom that they have to engage and participate in some of these issues. But the real issue for Paul here isn't so much that all Christians can now eat meat however they want. The real issue for Paul isn't so much the disputable matters. The real issue for Paul is how this church treats each other as they are working through these disputable matters. Because he goes on to say this in verse 3. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. See, the issue that Paul is addressing here is that there are individuals with differing convictions on disputable matters, and they are spiting each other in the church. 
I mean, the scene would be a church picnic, right? We have a church picnic every year in August. Imagine that, right? Out at a park, and you have two groups of people. On one side of the park, you have a group of Christians who are firing up the grills, like smoke is wafting in the air. You can hear the sizzle of burgers and brats on the grill, and they're just like, this is going to be amazing. And then you have another group at that same picnic from the same church, and on their side of the park, there's just a spread of salads and fruit trays and pasta salads and no meat at all. And then somebody with a burger in hand walks from one side to the other, and there's somebody who says, how can you call yourself a Christian and eat a brat like that? And that individual would be like, hey, back off, grow up, take those spiritual shackles off your ankles and enjoy life for a change, right? Like they would be arguing over something like that. And Paul is concerned that they're spiting each other. They're living with contempt towards each other. They're judging each other all around something as simple as the food that they eat, even though Jesus has set us free. And the question for us is, we don't do that, do we? (laughs) No. Right? I mean, you walk around any group of people, Christians or not, for a hot second, and you learn real quick, oh, we are all judging each other all the time, right? And the question is why? Like, why do we do that? Could be because we really love being right, right? could also be that we really like being in control. And when somebody doesn't do things our way or the way we think they should or with the mindset that we think they should, it's really quick to be like, they're wrong, I'm right. The the first argument that Becky and I got into when we were married was on our honeymoon and it was over dinner that we were cooking. Uh, We were cooking shrimp and it was like garlic butter shrimp. And um, I've learned over the years, and it's taken me almost 15 years, 16 years of marriage to learn this, that I love to control things in the kitchen. For some reason, like the way food is made is really significant to me. All right, so our kids now love to help in the kitchen. I'm like, don't cut it that way. No, hold it this way. No, don't do that. Put, let me just do it. I'll show you how to do it, right? So like Becky and I are trying to cook shrimp and she's peeling the shrimp and she's putting it in the thing and I'm telling her how to do it and she has like this skillet and she's like, I will do it my way. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) It's just shrimp, Ryan, remember, right? But we love being in control and we love being right. And when we lean into that, thinking that's what's most important and that's our top priority, the natural outflow is judgment condemnation, and contempt. And Paul is saying here, don't do that. Like, stop. But it's one thing just for him to say, stop, don't do that. What he does next is he tries to give them perspective in hoping to help them see who they are. He's hoping it will curb the judgment. Or you could say it this way. It's not so much just who they are, but whose they are. He says this in verse 4. He says, You, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now, you could read that verse and think what Paul is saying, like, I have my servants, you have your servants, and the issue in the church in Rome is that people are judging each other's servants, and I'll let you and your servant take care of themselves. I let my servants operate the way I do, and you let your servant operate the way they do, and we just won't judge each other, and everything will be fine, right? Because he's saying, who are you to judge, verse 4, someone else's servant? But I wonder if what Paul is saying here is not so much that we have servants, but that we are servants. Who are you to judge somebody else's servant? And the servants he's referring to belong to the master, the true master, who is Jesus. Like, who am I to judge Jesus' servants? Which means me judging my fellow servants. Meaning, who am I? I'm a servant. I'm not the master. I'm not the Lord. I'm not the one in charge. I'm a servant. And the job of a servant is not to judge, but to serve. 
And so Paul is trying to help them see that our role is not judge, it's not master, it's servant. And notice as I read through this next section, how many times the term the Lord appears in these next few verses, starting in verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than the other. All Paul is doing here is highlighting another disputable matter. Not only are people arguing over what they can eat, they're also arguing over what day is more sacred and holy than all the other days. And he goes on to say, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eat meat does so to who? To the Lord. For they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to who? To the Lord, and gives thanks to God. For none of us live for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Did you catch how many times he said the word the Lord there? In those few verses, seven times. You back up to verse 4, there's an additional two. Because the word there that's master, same Greek word for Lord. Nine times in a span of about five verses, Paul uses over and over and over the term the Lord, highlighting the lordship of who? Not you, not me, Jesus. That Jesus is the true Lord. He is the true master over all. And the way he has demonstrated that is both through his death on the cross and then namely his resurrection from the dead. That by coming back from the dead, he has showed that he has defeated death once and for all. He has defeated sin for all. And he's the one who makes the decision or the determination who's in and who's out. He's the one who has accepted all of us. And Paul is saying, why are you judging those whom God has accepted? Who are you to judge? See, the real issue for Paul isn't so much the disputable matters themselves. It's how we treat each other when we disagree, emphasizing that the call is to treat each other with love and respect even when we disagree. That's one of the real issues for Paul. Because then he goes on to say in verse 10, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? The real issue is how we treat each other when we disagree and do we have the ability and the capacity to respect each other in those places? The other issue that's at stake here for Paul is that it's Jesus who is Lord. He is the one who is the true Lord, which makes him the judge, not us. And Paul is saying that we all will have to give an account because all of us someday will stand before the Lord's throne and give an account of our lives. This is what he says, continuing on in verse 10. For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written... As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So, when my time is done and I stand before the Lord, I will give an account of whose life? Mine. Not yours. Not your brother's. Not your sister's. Not your mom's. I will give an account for my life. I will give an account for how I lived, how I led, the convictions that I have, the way that I engaged with God's people. I will give an account for my life. You will give an account for your life. So who do you need to be most concerned about? Yourself, right? We tell our kids this all the time. No, 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 no. Don't don't worry about your sister. You worry about yourself. Take care of yourself and everything will be fine. Paul is saying the exact same thing. And so what I think this means for us, it's not so much that we're fighting over the food that we're serving at church picnics, because again, it's not so much about the food, 
But I think what Paul is trying to drive home here is that dividing over disputable matters can destroy God's work. Dividing over disputable matters can damage the church and can damage our witness. Dividing over disputable matters can destroy what God is doing. Because that's where Paul will ultimately go in chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 20, he will say, Don't destroy the work of God over or for the sake of food. Now, again, remember, context is helpful here. At this point in history, the church in Rome is probably about 100 people. That's less than the people in this room. Like, there aren't multiple churches in Rome. There isn't First Baptist down the road, First Presbyterian on the other side of town. There is one church. It's less than 100 people, less than the number of people in this room. The city of Rome was about a million at that time, a million people. That's roughly the size, a little smaller than the size of Milwaukee. There was this many people or less to bear witness to the entire city of Rome. What's at stake here is huge. Paul is saying, if you guys get all up in each other's business about disputable matters. You're going to miss the bigger picture, which is bearing witness to this city for the love of God, that he is making all things new, that the Savior has come, that the true Lord has arrived. It's not Caesar, it's Jesus, and he can change your life. But instead, you're fighting about what you can eat and which day of the week is most holy. And you're compromising the work of God. Now, Fortunately, God is bigger than we are. God is bigger than our disputes. And God's work can and will continue even if we get it wrong and mess it up. But early on in my ministry, I lived through a long season of church splits and church divides. And it was brutal. I got hired at this church in Atlanta, and a couple years in, I came to realize there was this tension between the pastor and the board, and he ended up splitting off, and he took a group of people with him, and he started a church down the road, and then that just raised all all sorts of issues for us, and we kept, like, fighting with ourselves. More elders left. Another pastor came in. He couldn't get along, and so he left. He fired some people before he left because he was unhappy. Then the church that went down the road, they didn't last but a couple years, and it was like this mess of church splits. I just remember thinking, like, nobody's going to come to our church because word's going to get out. Like, that place is a hot mess, and nobody's going to come, and we're going to lose our opportunity to help people who are hurting, to help people find Jesus, and to show them that there is a better way to live because we can't even get our act together. See, dividing over disputable matters can damage our witness. Now, this goes back to our question at the beginning. Okay, is it ever okay to leave a church? Is it ever okay to leave a church over disputable matters? Is it ever okay to leave a church when you disagree? And just to let you know, you can take a big sigh of relief. I would say yes. So you don't have to worry, like, is my pastor condemning me because I have left a church in the last couple years and I disagreed with them? It is okay. Because the reality is, like, you have to follow your convictions. And you have to do what you think is right. And you stand before God at the end of time, not me or anybody else. But here's my encouragement to you. Here's my challenge to you. Here's what I would say is more significant in terms of how you navigate that decision than whether or not you actually make the decision. I think there's two things that we can and should do before we ever leave a church because we disagree over a disputable matter. The first thing is get curious. Get curious. Meaning Paul here is saying, don't judge, don't hold people in contempt, get curious. Start to ask the question why. Start to have an open mind and say, like, tell me more about that. Why is it that you believe that rather than this? It was December of last year. A pastor friend of mine in the area, uh, he and I were in a conversation. And in that conversation, it came out that he and I disagreed on on a significant theological issue. And it was one of those issues that I started to wonder, would it compromise whether or not we could partner together as pastors and churches in the area. 
And so we talked about it and went around a little bit. And then I left that conversation and I said, I really need to figure out how he sees this issue. And so for two months, all I did was listen and study and read people who were saying things that agreed with his position on this issue. And I said, I have to understand where he's coming from. I listened to things on YouTube, found lectures, listened to podcasts, read things for two months. Now, at the end of those two months, I still disagreed with him, right? And, and I found more reasons why I disagreed with him. But then what I did next was he and I got together. So not only get curious, but get together with that person. And then we were able to talk. I was able to ask my questions. I was able to say, like, here's the holes that I see in your argument. Here's the things that I'm wondering about. Can you fill me in on this? Can you help me with that? And through that process, what happened is real relationship began to develop. Like, it is possible to be in relationship with people and actually like people even though you disagree with them. Like, our world needs to know that. Like, our world needs to desperately know that because we are so quick to cancel people for doing one thing wrong, saying one thing wrong, or disagreeing with us. We just cut them off like nothing. And if you're in the context of a church, you could find that through getting curious and through getting together and building relationship, you come to this place where you could say, I can actually be here. I can exist in this place. I can disagree with them on this disputable matter because it's not a salvation issue. Like Paul himself names that there are, there are issues in the church that we won't all agree on. I can be in a place where I disagree and still worship God. And what the world needs is they need to see that. They need to see the body of Christ really being the united body of Christ, not the fractured, splintered, and fragmented body of Christ. And, and what if? What if the church got so good at cultivating unity? And what if the church got so good at nurturing relationship in the process of disagreement that the world said, you know, we're having a hard time here trying to figure out this dispute. Let's go to the church down the road. Because they seem to still get it right, even though they disagree. They seem to hang in there, even though they disagree. Because here is what's really important. The issues that are really important for us is that Jesus is Lord. Like, Jesus is Lord. That's the way Paul starts Romans. That is the gospel that Jesus is Lord. Praise God, because I'm not. I would make a terrible Lord, right? He's Lord, and He is good, and He is gracious, and He is kind, and He is merciful, and He is compassionate, and He is loving. And someday we're all going to stand before Him, and it's going to be terrifying, but I rest in the fact that the description that the Bible gives of Him is true, and therefore I don't need to live in fear, but I can go before that moment in my life and say, I'm submitting myself to the goodness and compassion of God. Because God, that is the way that you have described yourself. And if we can embrace that character of him now, we have the ability to extend it to others. And that's what the world needs. The world doesn't need a church to be right, dotting all its I's and crossing all its T's. The world needs to see a church that cares, that loves, that is compassionate, even when we disagree with them, that our heart would break so that we can introduce them to Jesus and give them hope. So may you see that Jesus is the true Lord over all. May you rest in the fact that he is judge and you are not. And may that free you to cultivate love and respect for those with whom you disagree. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have treated us that way. Lord, that at times you 
Extend love, mercy, and compassion to us. Even though we flat out disobey. Lord, we recognize that, that we are needy people. That, that this is a hard reality to step into. To be in relationship with people even though we disagree with them. To be able to hang in there over disputable matters and know that at the end of the day, the main thing is the gospel. It's the good news that you are Lord, that you have come back to life, that you are in the process of making all things new, and that we are included in that new creation. So Lord, we ask that you would give us perspective. We ask that you would help us see things clearly, and we would be able to fully surrender our lives to you. Pray this in your name. Amen.